Over the last few years, I've made my fair share of Roblox games. Ah! Ah! Oh God! I always get asked how they are made or get asked for tips on how someone can make their own versions of them. So today, I figured I'd make a quick horror game from scratch and also show you how some of the most well-known parts of my games were made. They're actually all pretty simple and a little greasy iPad kid could probably make a good one themselves. So here I am in Roblox Studio and I always start with just a basic idea of what I want to do. I never have much thought out. So here I have this abandoned house that I found in Oregon that I want to build. That's going to be the main subject of the game. And I just start by building from the ground up. I don't use any plugins or anything like that. I just build what looks good to the eye and go from there. I don't have any special tactics for building or anything like that. I've been building with the same style for as long as I can remember. And I don't really do much building on Roblox anymore, so my style has never really changed. But I always go for this build style that's kind of in between detailed and simple. I think it works pretty well for Roblox, and it kind of works for these horror games. So I don't do any crazy detailing, I just build the walls, the windows, and just some basic textures, make them look 3D. I always try to build something based off real life because it's just easier to make something more believable that way. For horror games, I think it works well if you're building something that the viewer is going to find familiar. But then after that, I add some basic terrain, just grass. I want to make this game really as isolated as possible and have this house the only thing in it. I took some inspiration from this TikTok actually. I just added basic details like a well, a windmill, and an old mattress in the yard just to make it feel a little less empty. But for the inside of the house, I didn't do any detailing at all. It's supposed to be empty inside, and I think it'll work for what we're trying to go for. I think what's really most important in these Rust games is the sound and the ambiance, so that's what we're going to focus on after building. I also like to add some features where it kind of restricts the player's options for what they're doing. So I'll lock them in the first person, I'll lower the walk speed and stuff like that. This is all coding that you could learn in a day. So as you can see, I lowered the walk speed and locked them in the first person, and already it's kind of looking like a horror game, but we still have a lot to do. So I took some scripts from some of my other Roblox games, which just kind of make the camera movements a little more smooth. And now you can see it's really starting to look a little more real. So after that, I start adding in sound. So I just added a basic kind of nighttime ambiance because this game will take place in the nighttime. I just haven't set it to that yet. But just go for something basic, something that just sounds like it really would in real life. Don't go for anything over the top because it'll ruin the immersion. So I add that into the workspace, set it to looped, and set it to playing, and you're all set. But after that, I'm going to add in a sound for the windmill, basically just a creaking sound as it moves. Just small things like this are going to make a huge difference and make it seem a lot more believable. You can see it sounds like something actually would in real life. So after that, in all of my Rust games, I usually add some random sounds that play throughout the game. They don't have any purpose, but they put the player on edge, and it works for creating like artificial scariness, I guess. So what I do is I add a folder into the workspace, I call it sounds, and I'll put the nighttime ambiance in there. And I'll also create another folder and title that random. And then in there, I'm just going to add some random sounds that I'd like to play throughout the game. So I already have some that I've made in Rust over the past few years, and you can hear them right now. They don't serve any purpose, but if you were going to make a full-fledged game, maybe you could. Or you could just keep them in there because they make it scarier. So then once you have a couple sounds in there, I just create a script. I won't tell you how all this works, but if you want to look it up, they're all pretty simple scripts. All I'm doing here is just making it so every once in a while in the game, it's going to pick a random sound from that folder and it's going to play it. So right now I have it set to happen in between 15 and 120 seconds, but I'm going to lower that just for the demonstration purposes here. Obviously, in an actual game, you'd want to have it be a lot longer. They don't have any purpose or any reason to it, but it works. So then, pretty much all my games have jump scares, so I'm just going to make one for this game. Really basic. You might have seen in some of my games I had a scarecrow. I don't really know what I was doing with that, but we're going to do that again. So all I'm doing is putting a scarecrow in the map, and I'm dropping it into replicated storage. And what this does is just make it invisible, basically. And whenever you want, you can put it into the workspace and it'll appear. So after that, I create a hitbox, which just makes it so whenever a player walks into this box, 
the scarecrow will appear, or whatever jump scare you want to happen. So I shape it how I want, I set it transparent, and turn off can collide, and then we're going to work on the script. So then all I'm going to do is set it so whenever a player touches that block, it moves the scarecrow from replicated storage into the workspace and also plays a jump scare sound, because it's not going to be scary without a sound. This is pretty much as simple as a jump scare can get, but I just want to show you the absolute basics for all my Rust games. So then I look for the right jump scare sound, and I, I like to go for something that's not too over the top, but still will be a little scary. So I found this one that's pretty good, and all I'm going to do is drop that into the sounds folder that we created earlier. And then I'm going to add a line into the code that sets it so whenever this happens, it plays that sound. It's super simple, and you can see it work here. So after that, it's really just basic things, setting the world to look how you want it to look. So obviously I don't want it to be daytime, because daytime is usually not scary. So I'm going to set it to night, I'm going to add some fog, I'm going to make it a little bit darker. And after that, the game's done. It's super simple, obviously it's not as complicated as most of my games, but this is how all of them started out, and you can basically work from here to make any one of my Rust games. Roblox Studio is even more powerful than it was when I first started Rust, so you can really make a scary game pretty easily now. So I'll show you an unedited clip of what it looks like playing this game, and then we'll get into some of my actual Rust games and some of the well-known features that people want explained. So now I'll explain how some of the most well-known parts of my games were made. And before we get into this, I just want to say, these games are very old, and as I said in the other video, these were not made well. Most of the methods that I use to script these games and code them are not what you should do, and I'm just going to be showing these as sort of a demonstration. But if you want to make a game like these, I would really recommend looking up how to properly do them, because everything in these games is really scuffed. So I'll start off with the first game. This is the main Rust game, the hub game. Ever since I first made Rust, people have wondered how I made it so when Albert joined the game or other YouTubers, it says their YouTube name or their name or whatever like that. And it's actually really simple. This, you could learn how to code uh, probably your first day, but basically all it does is I have this long script that does the whole GUI thing at the beginning, the identifying, and all it does here you'll see if the player name is these three usernames here, which these are like three accounts he was using it, and that's literally all it is. There was nothing that detected like an IP address or anything, it was just these couple usernames. And I could set this so any username would show up as something, it's really easy. So one of the next most asked things is how I made the fake players or the little goblins in uh, Smile and Happy, so I'll show you that right now. So this game actually didn't have fake players, this one just had a little goblin that follows you around, he teleports behind you and he freaks you out every once in a while. Um, might be this guy, but I think it was a smaller one. Okay, so yeah, here's the, uh, here's the man in question, just outside the map. But this is pretty simple and it was not made well. So here's the script inside this little goblin. And how it works is basically if there's, uh, more than zero players, it takes a random player, and I have it set so you can detect the front and back, whatever the direction the player's looking. And then this monster will teleport behind them to the back of them. And then it'll wait a certain amount of time and it'll do it again. That's pretty simple. And then I also have this, which is a little area that like uh, is in front of the guy. And basically if you step there, he'll run away. So here you can see he's just chilling right now. But you get a little bit too close and he runs away. Pretty simple stuff there. That did not take long to make. One of the longest things that took to make are the computers in all these games. But they're basically copy and paste once I made the first one. This one, I got a lot of questions about. What what the freak does this thing do? People were asking me, they were saying, what does this do? 
Uh, the answer, nothing. You'll see here, this is the computer, uh, pretty simple. And if you go into it, you can see here's the program. And you can see here's the secret behind the numbers. All it does is when you click on the number, all it does is it, it picks a random number between five. And then it just sort of does a whole random thing. It just picks random numbers with a random amount. Now, obviously, I did have intentions to actually make these do something and make sense. But pretty much every single Rust game never got past the first stage. So now we'll take a look at Smile. And I kind of talked about this in the other video. But I want to explain more how the fake characters in this game actually work. So basically when a player uh, walks in front of them, it chooses a random number and if the random number is what it wants, then it'll play that animation. So it just happens randomly. So you can see they kind of just randomly do it. So this one did it. This was actually like one of my most favorite parts of the Rust games. I thought these were so cool. I kind of wish I expanded on them more, but I never really got to that. So this wasn't really requested, but uh, in my game, can you see it? I had this character here, and I don't think many people think about this, but uh, I think it's a good example for if you want to make a horror game. I had it set so every once in a while while this guy was chasing you, it would play this like creepy animation. Oh my God, I literally hate my, oh my God. Ah! No, please! And I just thought it was the coolest thing. I don't know, I loved it when I made it. I thought it was like pretty unique. I think I got some inspiration from a movie or something. All it was was it play an animation randomly where like the head would twitch. And I made this audio that went along with it. And all the audio is, is me rubbing two quarters together. But it worked really well for this. This game actually had kind of a cool feature I think we can talk about. I feel like a lot of horror games really lose the immersion when there's like boundaries or stuff like that. So here I created like this fake boundary and then whenever you stepped on this block, it would make this river collapse. And then I made an invisible part along this river that was a conveyor and it carries the parts along it when it drops. Yeah, that's most of the big things I can think of that people have asked. If you have any other questions about things in my game, leave them in the comments below. And since these games are super old and they don't really matter anymore, I'm going to be opening them so all of you can take a look at them and understand how they were made. So I'm turning on place copying in all my games. And what this means is you can go on them, you can click the three dots up here, you can click edit in studio, and you can take a look at all the code. So all of them should be opened up and you should just be able to download a copy after this video is up. But yeah, if you have any other ideas for anything I should talk about about Rust, let me know. I'm happy to make more videos on the subject. But I do think I'm going to be starting to upload some normal videos like I was before. So just expect to see some Rust videos along with what I was doing before mixed in between the two.